Once again, it is time to go road course racing. This time, though, not on a uh, one of those beautiful little perfect facilities, but it's on the tight and twisty Chicago Street Circuit. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Windy City for the iRacing Indy Pro 2000 Series presented by Cooper Tires. It is bound to be an incredibly exciting race for us tonight. Uh, of course, uh, street circuits are always a staple on any road course race series schedule, and there's not a whole lot around when it comes to iRacing. You've got Detroit, you got Long Beach, and now brand new to the service, the Chicago Street Circuit introduced just this past season. And boy, oh boy, Lorenzo, it should be a very fun one here today. Lorenzo Bond, of course, joining myself, the Lorenzo in the commentary box, and Google is down behind the cameras. This is, of course, the uh, second time, I believe. Check that, not the second time. This is the only time we're going proper uh, street circuit racing throughout the entirety of the season so far. I have a feeling we could be in for a very good race ahead of us here, Lorenzo. We could, you know, Nolan, because this is one of those tricky tracks. I never I never actually got a first-hand experience in this track. I haven't clocked the single last of Dumomea Koopa right here. But I was watching races in so many categories, and it's not the easiest track to drive, but... From I got from the feedback from the drivers, they love to drive it, even though it's a tricky one to do it. It is 12 turns that make up the uh, Chicago Street Circuit. Uh, all of them are pretty much 90 degree corners wherever you look. Save a course for turns 8, 9, and 10. Now that's kind of where the track divots a little bit. Kind of goes for a bit of a sweeping section all the way through the long turn 9. I think the biggest pass I was doing to though here today, Lorenzo, is actually going to be into turn six. It is at the end of the longest straight on the track, a nine to three left-hander right out of turn five, which could be tricky to mask for a couple of drivers. The track kind of bottlenecks in the corner right before it, uh, at a 45 degree angle corner of turn four. It's going to make it very interesting for drivers to remain side by side to that opening section of the lap. The track really kind of widens and then gets so much narrower as you kind of go through these various little corners. And that's one of the things that makes it so interesting. What I what strikes me the most about this layout here, Lorenzo, is turns one and six. Exact same intersection, which is right near the Hutchinson Field in Chicago. Of course, one's going over to the left and one's going to the right. Yeah, the, it, it's interesting how they actually uh, are de developed, right? And it's, and it's a very tricky radius corner, especially both of them, to be very honest. But I'm very interested to see how they negotiate through four and five. So I was looking at the layout. It's this it's kind of like a sweeping not slow corner uh, going to four there is a breaking zone going over there but five you kind of have to commit into it and it's it's not easy especially the co tires for you to manage that but it should provide a very interesting race for us today we're currently watching Greg Seitz on his uh, first flying lap on the qualifying session. He's just coming on up through turn three, down for four. This is where he gives a little dab on the brakes to throw that car through turn four, and then immediately hard on the brakes again, down for five. Clips that concrete wall just at the right side at the apex before kind of going downhill a little bit as the track kind of sweeps back to the left and right with little, various little bits of banking up for turn six. Hard on the brakes again for the other side of that intersection at the Hutchinson Field. Diving on up for a very short blast over the crest and the bridge over the train yard to turn seven. Now, this is my favorite section on the track here. Not so much for racing, but definitely when it comes for driving. I mean, you can just look at it here. It's so flowing, so sweeping. It's a huge challenge for these drivers to master. It is one of the biggest challenges for them to master because you can save so much time in there. And there's a certain level of aggression. You can try to tackle that turn to maximize your efficiency around the corner and on the lap itself but there is that uh, big big margin for mistake and if you do it the wrong the wrong way you can your lap can go to shambles as greg size does the second best lap of this field so far now the most critical part on this track and the most the part of the track we're going to have to watch over the most so far is actually going to be turn 10. And the reason why, the road kind of splits off into two. These drivers have to go to the left of a tire barrier that juts out pretty much right into the racing line. You clip that barrier, you're going to collect not just yourself, but if you're at the top end of a group of cars, you're probably going to collect at least a couple of the guys in behind you as well. In fact, if we can, I'd like to take a ride on board with Greg Sides as we come on up through the section. You'll be able to spot the barrel, uh, the tire barriers instantly. They'll be neon yellow, so it's hard to miss. That doesn't mean it's not hard to uh, miss them when it comes to hitting them. As he gonna, he's going to go up and down the uh, the bridge, and you're going to see right there on the right-hand side, the tire barrier just stays so close, nearly glued to the tire barrier, Greg's sides. And it's one of those tricky sections, you know, as he goes through 9 and 10, that uh, if you do it a proper way, it, it can save a lot of time. But this one for me is the tricky one because some people 
I think in the beginning, I actually thought this uh, turn could have been a little bit to the uh, to the inner radius of the corner, but it isn't, and, is, and it can actually get some people off if you don't practice well enough. You see a lot of little adjustments being made on that wheel, a lot of little motions as he kind of jostles with the car. It's a 19.232. That's enough to put him up on pole position from Martin Arnoldis up at the sharp end of the field, about half a tenth of a second off of the number five car. So Sight's currently on pole at the end of his second lap, just one minute remaining. Yeah, one minute remaining, and uh, apparently, uh, I think I'm looking over here, I think six drivers in the grid haven't done the lap so far. Still trying to get their pace in the track, and it, it, it it's like Long Beach, right? I think the the only track we can make it a little bit of an analogy might be Long Beach of all tracks here, uh, Nolan. That uh, you don't have too much runoff areas, so if you go into the wall, you're basically gonna get a contact, a zero X, but that is enough for you to invalidate your lap. So here is Hans Seeger. A driver who had his first lap invalidated and now on his second flying lap with 15 seconds on the clock. Coming on up to the final corner now with 10 seconds to go. This will be close here for Seager to try to get that lap in. Under 10 seconds, he's out of the final corner trying to blaze to the start finish line. Is this going to be enough to get at the line? I think just barely at the buzzer. Logs a 120.559. Good enough for eighth place. So Seager going into the top 10 right at the buzzer. So Taking a look now at the starting grid. Greg Seitz on pole position with Martin Arnoldis in second place. Brian Molitor is going to be in third with Fabio Birchtold in fourth. Mitchell Ian Green is in fifth place with Roman, uh, Roman Foe down in sixth. Jeffrey uh, Koenigsfeld is in seventh place with Hans Seeger in eighth. Nicholas Doyle is in ninth with James Allen rounding out the top, end, uh, uh, the top ten on the field here, Lorenzo. At Tony Schroeder and Joseph Lesser round out the grid, uh, row number six. With uh, Stefan, our own race spot, Stefan Schlacke in 13th and Earl Setzer in 14th. David Radley, Shane Holstein, and Steve Tobin round out the 17 car grid here, Nolan. And uh, I think the big differential, other than so many other races we have over here, is the fact that we have a rolling start. And I think that honestly might be a bit of a blessing in disguise for a lot of these drivers out there at the moment, Lorenzo. So it's such a tight starting area. It's a tight first corner as well. I'd be very surprised if a lot of drivers would be necessarily happy with having to run uh, with uh, a, a standing start. Not to say it can't be done. It'd be certainly interesting to see if that would be uh, the case. So, uh, you know what? I'm going to uh, kind of throw it down over to our guy on the track there. Stefan Schlacker is down there on the track at the moment and just waiting for the rest of the drivers to grab on up. Stefan, you had a bit of a moment in both of your qualifying laps, but that's not to say you can't go through the field like you did at Iowa. Yeah, a little bit of a mind lapse there, turning a little bit too early for turn, what I think that's turn four, that 45 degree angle corner, and touched in, uh, clipped the inside wall, and it threw me right into the outside wall. Uh, and yeah, I didn't have enough time anymore to do that second lap, sadly, but should be a good one. I hope I can get a top five finish here and not finish like uh, I did in Iowa. What do you think some of the areas on this track are going to be to look out for, particularly on these opening few laps? Uh, most definitely, I, th I think that's turn nine, that very long left-hander that we have here. And then the shot back on the other side of the road. Uh, there's some really nasty bumps there that can off-throw your car right when you want to brake for the second to last turn. So, could be tricky there. Uh, and also turn number six, uh, where you have that very steep bridge. Uh, it's going to be a really hairy one there because most definitely a lot of people might be locking up the brakes and shoot into the tire barrier on the outside there. And it's really tricky to then get past them because of how narrow the track is there. Well, here's the hope, Stefan, that you have yourself some good luck today. Uh, hopefully you'll find yourself at the sharp end of the field before long. Starting from 13th, hopefully you'll be finishing within that top 10. So now we're just still on this one and only pace lap. The pace car just coming around through turn number five, leading to the field behind. You can see a lot of the guys here are just kind of splitting apart a little bit more, giving each other some room to work with on this opening pace lap. No doubt though, Lorenzo, it's going to get a little bit feisty when we start to bunch on up for the green flag. It's going to be interesting how they're going to run into turn number one, two, and three, right? Because it is, they're going to be so close to one another. Basically side by side is going to be basically scrambled to four and five. 
Starting around that second half of the lap. A couple of these drivers really cutting it in tight. Should note as well, one driver is not going to be making the main start. David Bradley, a driver who was due to start 15th place, has not started on the grid. He's going to be starting this one from pit road. The only driver to not grid up throughout the field. So this will be... Uh, It'll be interesting here to see how this is going to work. The field, though, coming through this sweepy section for the only time before we go green flag race, and even double vial is slow. You can see how much they kind of struggle with it. Not a lot of room to work within this section of the track. Steph was mentioned this would be a place to watch, Lorenzo. So your final thoughts here as we start to round these last couple of corners. I've uh, never seen these kind of cars race around the street track like this. I mean, like this is Chicago uh, that ha that is so tricky. I think this is a whole different game than Long Beach. Of course, Long Beach... It's historic on its own, so let's see how they're going to tackle this for 22 laps. Coming around the final corner, the iRacing pace car, the Porsche 911 GT3 safety car, going to pull it off down to pit road, leaving it in the hands of Greg Sides. Out of the final corner, he launches early and gets away by a couple of car lengths. Already our Nolan is having to cover off against Brian Moulter's release throw go. Green flag racing from the Windy City. Locking up the wizard. Deep in turn one, loses the big handful of spots, but he manages to keep it out of the wall, and everybody else keeps it out of each other in the wall behind him. So clean run through turn one and through turn two. Greg size clear out in front, looking to be side by side for second place. Brian Moulter going on, on the offensive from Fabio Burstol. And let's see who's going to have the advantage coming to turn number four right here. That might have Birchtill's name right over, all over it, but the inside doesn't favor him. But it actually did him this time around. So Birchtill retains second spot as we have a scouted point around. That's Roman Foe in the background and nearly getting clipped. Oh, he does clip. Joseph Lester, whose front wing is gone and has a broken suspension. Now Roman Foe uh, should have just held the brakes there, unfortunately. And that collected the number 15 machine. He'll be out of the race, no doubt. Uh, field still green, though, as we watch the battle with Mitchell Ian Green, Arnoldus, and Molitor coming through turn nine. And right behind this Koenig stall, Jeffrey Koenig stall, and he actually got his door slammed shut by uh, our notice on the entry for number six right there. As we see on the replay, what happened to Roman Foe? The car just decided to bottom out during the transition right there. The problem is, oh, don't you reverse oh. that on the corner. So you have to be predictable there a little bit. That's why Joseph Laster was caught up or right there. You saw, he, uh, Laster saw the driver kind of duck, or trying to back it up, so he immediately shot to the right, tried to get through, but then he moved forward again and closed the door all over, so unfortunate for uh, him. We'll have to see if he can maybe recover, but I think it's going to be a long shot. Apart from that, though, a clean opening lap for this race. A lot of field is kind of split apart a little bit, but that is uh, to be expected. Uh, Toby Schroeder, I'm looking at the back, he just lost a spot, and he's got a little bit of damage on his machine here, actually. He was running by himself in 11th place, and looks like he actually might have had a collision with the turn one barriers. Ooh, that is not nice. You can see that car is slow, definitely damaged. The uh, right side kind of caved in a little bit, you could definitely tell. Something not right with Tony Schroeder's car. Deep on the brakes. Oh, too deep. Locking up. Oh, there's the hit to the wall. That will do it. That answers why Tony Schroeder's going so slow. Just trying to nurse it back to the pits. James Allen's also had a spin out of the top 10. So a lot of guys are really struggling with this street circuit early on. Yeah, and it's also interesting to see that Green actually got back his fourth place from Arnotas into the entry off turn number 9 and 10 right there. And uh, kind of checked up things a little bit uh, because Jaconic Salt also had to check up right there as well. So interesting racing on the mid pack of this field so far. Battle is on for 8th and 9th as well. Stefan Schlacker working down the field. Just got past Nicholas Doyle. Doyle trying to come back to win a turn number one. Thinks better of it. Schlacker gets the position in the turn number one. It was the decisive move from Schlacker into that final corner. Got the run out through turn 11 and was just deeper on the brace through 12 to pick the spot up. You saw Doyle try to cut back. Uh, no success, though, for Nicholas Doyle to do so. And there you can also see uh, James Allen losing to the spot. That was against Roman Foe. The number nine car suffering that spin on the early lap with a wounded front wind. It's kind of bouncing around in the wind so far, uh, just making a pass up on the 12. The racing continues throughout the entirety of the field so far, but it's definitely picking up around third on back to about the uh, sixth or seventh position. That's a five-car train that you got in there. That's all uh, where a lot of the action is at the moment on course. 
Brian Molitor heads up this field in third place. Then comes Mitchell Ooh. Ian Green, Martin Arnoldes, Jeffrey Koning, uh, Koningsfeld, and Hans Seeger bringing up the rear. And, and it looks like, uh, I might be wrong over here, but it, it looks like Arnoldes car bounced off the wall a little bit. It's kind of like a small bounce when you just hit the frame of the tire into the into the uh, Arco barrier. As Greg size just decides to fly around the track and does the fastest lap once again. Fastest lap for Greg Seitz. Martin Arnoldes trying to take this one around the outside of Mitchell Ian Green for turn two. Can't quite get there. Loses out in the battle around the outside line. But Arnoldes is starting to get a little bit more aggressive here. Trying to see if he can run down Mitchell Ian Green in that number two, uh, number four position in the number two car. Out through four and five. Oh, Arnoldes loses it Whoa. and somehow snaps it back. Somehow snaps it back, but it brings uh, Jelfrock Koenigsaal into this one. Let's see if he's going to be aggressive. No, he tucks back into the rear. Oh. Arnoldes nearly touches the back wing. We got Carson oh, 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 no. oh. Big pile up. Oh, and Stefan nearly gets run over as well. That's three cars collected all at the same time here. Started off by Joseph Lester, who already had damage in his number 15 machine. Coming on down through the corner. Not sure what happened to Joseph Lester, but you see him going on deep in there. Then comes the number five car and more right in behind. Bad luck for all three drivers caught up in this one. Stefan Schlacker, though, he's not complaining. He made up three spots in that one turn alone. It looks like uh, that Lester actually had no tires. Like he lost a tire on the front left uh, in the previous turn during through, during four and five and tried to nurse the car back into the pits, but had no grip whatsoever to make the turn of number six right there. And unfortunately caused the crash that uh, involved some of the drivers like Arnotis. Arnotis has officially left the facility, so he is uh, among our first retirements along with Schroeder and Lester on the day. So it's a big shame for both of them and you can see that car is already missing the front left wheel along with the front wing it's an interesting situation there isn't it this is from air and right here oh there's the five car then there goes somebody else spinning in right and behind it there was stefan you saw in the white and blue car just barely squeaking through that by the skin of his teeth almost banged wheels with one of those cars as they rejoined i think that was that number five machine uh, that he nearly collided with of arnoldus so you got this battle here for uh, fourth and third between Molitor and Green that is still picking on up. I'm also keeping my eye on the battle for 11th and 12th. That's been kind of going back and forth, but so far this battle for fourth is definitely just a touch closer. But you can see up there, that's Roman Foe up in front of James Allen. They were kind of swapping hands while all of that carnage was going on further up ahead of them. Yeah, Roman trying to get a little bit of a recovery drive into this one after the fumble into turn into lap one, which uh, got Lester involved in this one. As Heitz does another best lap once again, 119.634 for the number one car in this split. As we're looking now on the left hand side, the battle between Foe and Allen, and the right hand side, the battle for third place. As uh, there's some good pressure right here. I'm, I'm starting to wonder this track, I think you either rely on more of a driver mistake than trying to find the opening yourself as green goes for the move <laughs> oh and not for long though brian molitor trying to cut back in the turn five didn't quite work out for the seven car mitchell and green had the run coming down in the turn four you saw molitor try to get the crossover into five but it was just too far back to have a proper look that puts mitchell and green up onto the podium positions Started fifth, he's up to third now. So good run so far for Mitchell Ian Green, who is going to continue to try to work his way back up now to uh, Birch Told, who is about another three seconds up the road. That leaves the battle for 10th and 11th, which is still as close as ever. James Allen's starting to run down Roman Foe all over again. Looks like Allen's a lot better through turns three to four than Roman Foe is, but Foe just gets such a better drive off of these off of turn five. Now, I think the problem is for Foe. He's got a bit more speed, but that's because his front downforce is hurt. Because his front wing, it's wriggling around all over the place. Like we're talking, that thing is probably hanging on by like a cable, if that, or by a single lug nut. So he is really struggling in these corners, Roman Foe is losing a lot of front end downforce. And that's what's allowed James Allen to so close to him. So you're saying that he's hanging by a thread right there as uh, Allen's putting the major pressure right there. But I think this track, especially in the in this these low sections, looks like so hard to drive for you to actually get closer and make an overtake that you kind of have to rely, rely on the exit of turn number three and then go to three, four, and five to make that overtake. 
as they're going to reset, open up another lap, and then Allen might be able to make the move right here. James Allen is still a little bit better through turn one. We'll have to see how good Foe is through two. James Allen takes a bit of a tighter line, and that's going to give a bit more of a drive on Roman Foe. Now, watch that front wing on the uh, number nine car. You can kind of see just with that shot there, it is flooding the round just a little bit, and that really hurts him through some of these higher speed corners like turn three and turn four. The problem is James Allen can't get close enough to attack on the rest of the track. No, and, and and again, that's the main passing opportunity because everything else is kind of have you kind of have to rely on the driver mistakes. But now Allen, I think he has a run, then he's going to make the move on the inside. Foe's trying to fight this one around the outside, and he's going to hold on to the position. James Allen being a bit too conservative there on corner exit, and cut it into tight. Lost a lot of time in the process. So Allen once again falls in back behind. Oh. I think just kissed the wall there in the number twelve. Yeah, just a little slight grazing to the wall, you know, blessing that wall a little bit, but Allen still keeping it that on the track, but lost some time in between. Gap now that Foe has to Allen is about a second. This is one of the closer battles we have on the course at the moment, which is why we're looking at this battle further towards the tail end of the field. Now, the question is, how good will Allen be? He's got a lot of the draft to help him out here in this battle with Foe, but the problem is for Allen, he just... Like what we talk about, I mean, Foe's still better on corner exits, so Allen just can't get close enough to make the move. He's gotten close enough that he can have a look for the position, but he's never been able to have the speed to really complete it. Allen is driving very conservatively here. That's kind of what's hurting his race here. He could be through and no doubt further up in front by now. He's just standing behind. He doesn't want to take any big risks. I think that example going to turn number six right there, I think was the best example we could have seen. If you wanted to, he could have been very aggressive and go for a dive bomb, but I think he decided to be very, very slow and very conservative inside of the uh, corner of turn number six. And it looks like the car was parking on the apex, and uh, that's why Foe just decided to be faster on that specific instance, and and Alan decided to took behind. I think that's the most likely explanation. He's he's trying to make sure he can make it to the end of one piece, and that's not an inherently bad thing. At the end of the day, Definitely he not. only needs to have one lap to be in front of him, and that is, of course, the last one. So he can take all the time he needs, because, I mean, it, it's pretty obvious here from the pace. He's going to get past him. I mean, there's almost no doubt about that. James Allen absolutely has the ability to pass Roman Foe. He just needs to be able to get into a position where he's actually going to be aggressive and actually go for that position. Yeah, it's just a matter of when he's going to make that move, and like he said, and then uh, a big if. But other than that, it's it's been an interesting battle, you know, just to see how Foe has been going with that car, nearly going within the 24s, like 24 flat. But with a broken wing, it does show that uh, if you have any sort of damage on the front wing, it's going to be very, very bad because you're basically set for a second loss. And there you saw James Allen finally made the move. Roman Foe pulled over to the right side and pretty much let James Allen through. So that number 12 car is officially out in front of Roman Foe. Now the Canada 9 car try to run him down with all that damage on that front wing. The likelihood of being able to catch him again is going to be slim to none for Roman Foe. He's going to have to worry more about Earl Setzer out in behind who's still trying to run him down as well. But he's trying to stay with him though. I have a feeling this is a game where James Allen's conservative driving style could come back to hurt him. He's not as aggressive through some of these corners as Foe is, despite having all that damage. He's not, but the thing is, uh, Setzer has been doing 24 threes in average per lap, whereas Foe has been nearly ten, three tenths of a second faster. Only if it is there, there is a major aerodynamic drop off for Foe during the latter portion of the run, as you can see now. The wing is. We can. We, I'm trying to find a better way instead, instead of saying uh, of a movable wing, like a detachable wing, or a bendable wing. Trying to go into the F1 realms, but uh, so far I think these cars are performing so well, and uh, and foes so so far managing to hold that gap to sets. So. He's doing a decent job still on making sure that he can stay close. Unfortunately, it just isn't close enough to realistically have a shot. I mean, we're talking he's now three seconds back, and it's dropping back every single lap. So he just doesn't have a whole lot with him. A couple drivers that are starting to get a bit closer here, though. 
It's fifth and sixth place. Hans Seeger and Stefan Schlacka. Schlacka trying to now work his way up into the top five. Plus seven on the day. Second most spots gained apart from Steve Tobin, who's moved up eight. So our race ball commentator trying to see if he can maybe make up one more spot. Yeah, shades of Iowa for uh, Schlacka. But the only difference is this is a road track than a... Uh uh, a noble track and Shalaka doing really good with that uh, in the Pro 2000 and let's see because he's getting closer and closer the pace looks really good uh, during during this mid portion of the race for Shalaka instead of Sega two tenths gain and just turns four and five alone he is closing in like a hawk he is hunting down Hans Seeger in that number four car it's only a matter of time here before Stefan gets by, I'm thinking. I mean, he's been consistently quick. I mean, just the last lap by, we're talking six tenths quick on just the last lap alone. And look at how much closer he is now. The gap was a second at the top of the lap. It's under half a second now. That six car is right in the pounce. It is. It is going to be is going to be an interesting one. How Schlaka actually is going to negotiate that one because now he's on the back wing of Sega. And... Uh, and the number four car is gonna have to hope for dear life until uh, until he's able to actually get to the finish of this race. But uh, here we go as they open, gonna open up another lap and now Schlock is gonna go on the hunt. Breaking the draft a little bit, just trying to make sure he doesn't get too close into the breaking zone. You don't want to get that spot by, of course, sending your opponent into the wall. I think he's trying to set him up here for either turn four or turn six. It'll be one of those two. Mm. Diamond is off the apex of two. The six cars got all the speed of the world. Hans Seeger will be a sitting duck if Stefan chooses to go for it. Seeger chooses to go to the outside. Stefan to the inside. Going to make this pass into turn four. Seeger backs out. Tries to go for the over-under, but just doesn't have the speed. And that's going to give Stefan Schlacker the fifth position. Yeah, man, he just got the fifth position. Schlacker, he's got to go back in there. And uh, you can take a look. Going for that outside line, trying to set himself up to try to get back that position. The problem is, I think, uh, is not them two specifically. If they, if these two guys work together, there is a slim chance, and it's possible they could actually catch Brian Monitor, Monitor, because uh, both Shalaka and Sega have been slightly faster than lap per lap. Slightly faster. Steph was seven tenths quicker than him on the last lap by. That's a big gap. That's I wouldn't call that necessarily slight. So. I tell you, Stefan has the speed to go for a fourth place position. He's got himself 10 laps to go now, so he could easily be able to find himself up in V4 if he can just keep this pace up. It's been a good pace so far. He might actually be able to go for that fourth position, provided that Molitor doesn't you know, step up the pace himself and ended up putting in the really good lap times. True, and, and there's another problem for Sega right now is that the Clinic Soul is actually coming in hot on his wings. Because Sega actually did a 22-5 last lap because of the overtake and, uh, and the fumble during 4 and 5. Tony saw 20.9, so it is there is a round possibility that number 8 car in the field will get closer and make the move on, of, uh, of Sega. So this now becomes the uh, closest battle we got in the field so far on the day down for turn number six this is of course a common sight to see when it comes to street circuit racing like this it's a lot more common to see you know battles a lot more few and far between as a lot of drivers handle these types of circuits very very differently it's a lot harder to follow somebody close through circuits like this than say what we were seeing at the red bull ring where it was basically one massive line nose to tail for like the first half of the race it's very easy to get split apart because once you get a pass complete it's very very difficult to lose that pass just because of the nature of the track and that's got to do partially due to the bumps partially because of the tight turns the tightness of the track itself uh, a lot of factors kind of go into play when the you get to one of these types of races they're trying to follow somebody around yeah it's very tricky you know because uh, you said it yourself the bumps the the layout the, the radius of the turns and everything makes it really complicated it's, it's kind of easy to, for you to break the draft because we have no real long straight so there is no big chance of pack racing or anything of the sorts like we saw the red bull ring right so that's why it's surprise it's not surprising to see the cars split it's the split themselves apart this this or this time already in the race even early on in the race despite the fumbles one another being already split apart Hans Seeger is under fire eight and a half tenths back from Jeffrey Koenigsfeld and Koenigsfeld is trying to run it down loses a bit of a tenth in that last corner turn six 
through this midsection though this is where Koenigsfeld gains a lot of time on Hans Seeger is just so much faster through here Ooh. on those last two corners alone nearly a third of a second yeah and uh, you can see the commitment of Koenigsfeld in the turn right there nearly grazing the wall uh, as he goes around the fountain and the team undercut driver putting that work he wants that position from Seeger Six tenths and still getting lower. This is at the moment the only battle that's within one second we have on the circuit, and boy, is it one to watch. I mean, Hans Seeger, he was looking good to the star, worked his way all the way up. We're talking fifth, fourth place, and unfortunately, he's just been dropping back ever since. Koningsfeld hasn't made any spots up so far this race. He's started seventh, he has stayed at seventh. He's trying to pick up one and put himself up one position so far on the day, which would definitely be a big sign for Jeffrey Koningsfeld, a good sign for him. You look at how close he follows through turn number four. He is absolutely on it. Out through turn five and running up for six. A little bit down the little divot in the road. Hans Seeger is going to cut back over to the right side. Does he defend? Koningsfeld is not going to go for the position. Therefore, Seeger doesn't have to defend so hard. No, he doesn't. As they go up and down the bridge into turn number seven right now. And then going to go into eight. Ooh. And, uh, and, oh, go ahead. Koningsfeld clipped the wall. Just a little clip off of that left side. Maybe it won't affect too much the downforce as we see in green now behind Bristol. Yeah, it looks as though Fabio Bristol got really held up behind lap traffic of Earl Setzer, and that is putting Ian Green under fire. And here we can actually see the number three car getting really held up. That 11 car was not doing him any favors whatsoever. Look at how fast Mitchell Ian Green runs up and actually tried to go for this position around the outside into the final corner and dream just wasn't able to make it you know the car stopped on course as well david bradley is actually stopped on course at the moment and it's just kind of sitting between turns two and three he hasn't crashed he's just been slowing down and he's just yeah, been sitting there for the a wing. while now i just saw someone maybe i think someone lost the wing right there i found it for you steve tobin no not even uh, no front wing no front clip at all for the nine oh, car his okay. whole nose cone's been ripped off but to be fair, right there, as uh, we see now, Steve Tobin going around the, going around the uh, the bridge, as we are go back to Berto being pressured by Ingrid. To be fair, I don't blame the back marker a little bit right there because it's not the easiest uh, section of the track for you to lift up the gas and let someone go by because it, it, you have such as, as a short sequence of corners, like in terms of timing, that it is hard, is very tricky for you to negotiate. So two battles, one for second and one for sixth. Both battles equally close together. On screen at the moment is the one for second place with uh, Fabio Birchtold trying to fend off Mitchell and Green. Tell you what, this could be a battle for Birchtold. I mean, Mitchell and Green's been trying to run it down for so long. And look at the draft that he's got down through turn number three. Green can have a look for position here. Looks to the right side. Going to go for it down to turn number four. Birchtold's not lifting. And he does have to give it the spot through turn number Oh, no! Green loses it, gets it back, and gives the spot back to Fabio Birchtold as a result. And I think, I don't think Mitchell and Green will be close enough to make that spot of the rest of the race. If Ian Green was a cat, I think he he wasted about six lives right there. Good grief. Take a look at this one. Mitchell Ian Green, this is going to be on board. Coming on over, this is through turn four. Just a little too deep on the brakes. Got to be unsettled with the bumps under braking. And lose it all by himself. I mean, there was no contact made. That's just an unfortunate little slide for Mitchell Ian Green. It was a completely self-inflicted uh, error as the back end comes away. Yeah, unfortunate, but uh, somehow I think he has to be thankful that first it is a, uh, it was a very slow corner, so the car won't just like way too much, and he actually caught that really quick. And plus, the track widens after you go out of five, so that's why he didn't hit the wall. But that was a lucky one for Ian Green to keep it on track. So this leaves the battle for P uh, six and seven. Still nice and tight out there on the course. This battle has not really kind of let up at all as the race has gone along. And at this point, we're under five laps to go. Koenigsfeld trying to run down Hans Seeger for the sixth position. He's been all over the, the uh, gearbox of the number four car for the past several laps. He just hasn't been able to properly find a way through. Jeffrey Koenigsfeld is definitely having a good run of things so far in his number eight machine. 
It's just got to get close enough out through five to have that proper momentum for six. And maybe he's being patient, he's, you know, Koenig self, trying to cook the driver into a uh, proper error. Not I don't say proper error, but a slight error that will op open up the drafting gap for Koenig self to uh, make the move in and, and seal the deal as they have a back marker right in front of them. That is a little setzer, and they got themselves steered the way pretty quickly. And no lap, tro uh, lap traffic troubles this time for Earl Setzer. Koenigsfeld now trying to run down Hans Seeger. This will be a tough battle for the A-car to get past. I mean, Seeger has been doing a great job on defense so far as this race has gone along. Hasn't necessarily left too many doors open for Koenigsfeld to get through. That number eight car could try to get him, though, either into turn one or turn four this next time by. But as you can see how close he is, I would be a bit surprised if he didn't go for this one into turn one. Same. I would be very surprised as well because if you make the one, if you make the move on one and two, the problem is you become under a massive threat under the draft into three and four and five. So what's the point of making the move on that specific corner? We saw right there, there was more lap traffic from Steve Tobin that prevented Koenigsfeld on getting up there properly, and it even cost him quite a bit of time up to Hans Seeger's number four car. So Koenigsfeld is now still going to be right on the gearbox, still has about four and a half laps left where he can try to get a proper run. It, that doesn't mean it's not going to be a challenge, though. Passing out a track like this is very, very difficult. He's got his work cut out for him if he wants to make a proper go for position. Yeah, he has to kind of commit either in the last lap or two and then probably hold it. Final laps, but no! Oh no! Well, that ends that battle. Jeffrey Koningsfeld spins out by himself in the downhill braking zone. The car stepped down with him really early, just didn't lock the brakes up until right about here. Look at how far back that car was already sideways, and it took a while for that thing to actually fully snap loose. That's a bit of a weird situation. I don't think I've seen something like that in a while, but. I think him locking up those tires is what actually saved his race there. And you can see Earl Setzer yep. also uh, pulling it off as he had a collision with the wall as well as while all that was going on. That will about do it then for just about all of the battles we got so far throughout the grid. I mean, there's nobody at the moment that's really side by side with each other. Although that being said, I do see Martin Arnoldis who's had a collision somewhere. I think he's actually had a big shunt with Steve Tobin. Down at turn 10, I want to say? Maybe. Looks like it. He's missing the uh, front right suspension and the front wings. I think that has end of the day for our old. It goes from bad to worse. Last time was the right rear suspension that got that I kind of stepped out. This time it's the front right that's gone. And you can see how much Michelin Green is attacking these oh, corners, trying to see if he can maybe run down Birchtold. Yeah, but to be fair, uh, the driver on the number 17, Tobin, tried to come back into the track, do a 360, and got it right in front of our notice. So unfortunate for our notice to lose the tire right there, and his car is done. We should be looking at the gap. I, I was going to say, look at the gap between Shilaka and the monitor, because that was coming down lap by lap, and you're going to see now the incident uh, that happened. So this is our notice coming around the corner. There's Tobin, and you called it. Just coming back across the track and had a big collision. It's never pleasant when you get these types of incidents that have to involve one driver kind of coming across the track. We'll take a look at it on board from Arnoldis' point of view. And you'll see just how little reaction he has to give for this. Tobin's fine. Comes to the corner. Stopped. Nothing he could have done. Admittedly, it was kind of good that Steve Tobin tried to floor it. Because if he had actually floored that car and got it spun around, he would have been fine. It actually would have been worse had he just sat exactly where he was. Tell you what, though, this battle, though, for second and third is not over. Coming around, which I believe will be the last lap of the race. Just this very next lap, Birch told and Michelin Green still looking to do battle here for second place. It's going to be interesting how Green negotiates. His car on the late on the late portions of the race have been much pacier than uh, Birch told in, in, in this race. So I don't... I want to say that maybe Berto might be in the danger. Excuse <laughs> me, in the danger of losing the position, but it's going to be an interesting one. White flag is out for Greg Sainz, who is about nine seconds up the road, just around that range. You got Mitchell Ian Green still looking to do battle here with Fabio Birchtold. 
Getting gonna get a good drafting run all the way up for turn number four. They've got Tony Schroeder up the road. A lap car, 15th place. Driving that number 13 machine. Here goes Richard oh, Green, going. looking for the inside. Oh, and power slide in that oh. number two car out of turn five. How did he keep that on track? I really don't know. Up for six. I think that little slide might have cost him too much. You can tell by that back end stepping out, though, just how much he is running for. Brian Mullins has had a crash with Roman Foe. That has allowed Stephen Schlacker up into fourth place. And you can see this card is going on here. We'll take a quick look at this one. This will be a really short replay. This is all with Brian Mullins. This Foe. Oh, big hit for Foe up the road and nowhere for Mullins to go. That allows Schlacker through up into fourth place. The battle, though, is going to be on as Greg Sides crosses the start finish line. He wins the race for Chicago. Mitchell and Green trying to look for Noah to the last corner. Has one more chance to make this one out of turn 12. Green tries to get the run around the outside line. Not enough. It's going to be Fabio Bertschel to hang on for second. Nice hope from Bertschel to go for second right there. And the commitment done from. Uh from Mitchell right there on, on four and five. I honestly thought it didn't, it wasn't going to work out in our race spot zone with Stefan Schlocker. Hey, finishing P4, nicely done. Not a bad finish at all. It would have finished fifth, but Molitor's little crash there with Roma and Foe, which is brought about by Foe just running a little bit too wide. That is what helped Schlocker secure a fourth place finish. So good run for him, but Seitz easily wins up another race. Yeah, and uh, just solidifying his dominant season so far, and why he's probably the the prob the probable champion, you know, the nominal champion of the season in the Indy Pro 2000s. Oh, absolutely. We're uh, still waiting on a couple of drivers to come across the line. This is, I believe, the last driver on the lap, Nicholas Doyle, coming across the line over a minute behind your race leaders. There are still those couple drivers that you always got a way to come across the line. I think the last car coming across though is going to be David Bradley. Comes across the line now, and that is going to be it. The results are official from the Chicago Street Circuit for round number eight. I believe this is for the Irish and Indy Pro 2000 series. So we'll take a rundown now for the official post-race results as Brian Molitor officially logs one lap down as a dnf so it's going to be greg sites take a victory 9.3 seconds up fabio Burstold is down in second place with Mitchell and green rounding out the podium stefan schlacka picks up an impressive fourth place after starting 13th both spots gained on the day with hans seeger down in fifth jeffrey koningsfeld is going to be in sixth place with nicholas doyle in seventh the last car in the lead lap brian molitor running fourth for so long having that crash that sets him down to eighth place one lap down with James Allen and Roman Foe rounding out the top 10 here, Lorenzo. Yeah, Shane Holstein actually managed to get a really good result coming from 16 and finishing P11. Earl Setzer with the retirement finishing 12th. David Bradley finishing 13th. Steve Tobin, Tony Schrader, Martin Arnotas, and Joseph Lasser round out our 17 car grid over here, Nolan. Really good race. I was very impressed how these track handled these cars. It was a great race for sure. It was a really crazy race. There were quite a few crashes, which is to be expected on a street circuit. There was a lot of passing though, honestly, a bit more pass than I thought there would be and more pass than we usually see on a street circuit like this. Of course, if pass is what you want to see, uh, the next track's Monza. So you'll get plenty of that next week. Yeah, it's going to be the uh, draft fest of Monza and uh, basically swapping every single possible variante you can actually think of. You want overtakes at Retiflo? You got it. You want it uh, Curva Grande? You got it. You want it Della Roglia? You, you got it. Lasmo, you got it. Oscar, you got it. It's going to be a fun one. Should be a very fun one indeed. August 13th holds the Monza, one of the most famous racetracks in Italy and my personal favorite racetrack throughout the entire world. Uh, from that though, that is going to do it for round number eight of the iRacing Indy Pro 2000 series presented by Cooper Tires. I'm gonna Lorenzo with Lorenzo Bond beside me in the commentary box. Hugo Louise down behind the cameras for tonight's race. Join us next time, next week for more Indy Pro 2000 action from Monza and stay tuned for the Apex Formula 3 series and the iRacing Formula V series.